back. Think back when you were a child or any time prior to adulthood. You know, it's a vulnerable time, isn't it? And there are stresses. Boy, boy, I, I'll tell you what, school, high school, middle school, not easy, huh? Well, did you have an adult influence or maybe somebody just older, maybe an older sibling or an aunt or an uncle, maybe a parent, somebody who, um, somebody who was gentle and kind, who seemed to be in your corner, and whether that person was a formal teacher or just a mentor, just a presence, did you ever share that joy that that person felt? It was pretty clearly that person felt when working with you. Well, if you're going through a tough time and you have somebody there in a leadership, a leadership position, it can make an enormous difference. Well, I'll tell you something, whether it's our cats or our dogs, we're going through a stressful time right now with this epidemic, sheltering in place and well, social isolation, a lot of anxiety, a collective anxiety. My goodness, we're feeding off each other, aren't we? Um, well, you know what? Our pets read our feelings. They don't just sense them. They know because they pay attention to our body signals. And we can make a difference for them. And I've got a story I'm going to read you just a little bit. And by the way, just in case you didn't notice, there's a change of plans here. Um, because what I had put on my Facebook page that we were going to talk about tonight was we were going to go out in the Rio Grande Bosque, the area around the river here in Albuquerque, the Rio Grande, and I was going to show you exactly what you can do to safely and gently teach your dog to focus on you and earn reinforcers even when another dog came by because so many dogs just wig out on leash. They see another dog or an unfamiliar person and they just lunge and they snap. Anyway, we had to change plans because we got a windstorm this afternoon in Albuquerque. You know, we, we boast about our excellent weather here, you know, with um, 300 days of sunshine a year. But in the springtime, it can get a little bit windy. So we're going to postpone this thing about the dogs that wig out on leash until next week. Try it again. I think we'll get lucky because we almost always are here. So this time we're going to do something about cats. Um, by the way, in case we haven't met, I'm veterinarian Dr. Jeff Nickel, and this is our family border collie, Miss America, here. And we call her that because she's cute and perky. And this is Gaston. And Tony, are you going to come back up here? I have these special indoor hunting feeders for our cats. There's Tony. Here he comes. Um, because um, that certainly keeps them motivated. They show up here at the door to my home office like daily, hoping that, oh, maybe this is the day for a Facebook Live, because they normally eat dry food and they just love, I'm sorry, they normally eat canned food, and we put this, this dry food in these, these indoor hunting feeders. They're, they're meant to look like mice, and you put dry food in them, and cats will, uh, you know, extract the food, which is, not only keeps them busy, but it sort of simulates a natural feline activity of hunting, only, you know, they're not real mice. So, anyway. So thank you for being here. And um, let me ask you, has anybody here had a figure like that in their life, somebody who was, who was really there for them? There, very often the teacher comes away with greater personal benefits than the student because we, we really feel good about bringing out the best in somebody else. So let me tell you a little story here. And by the way, if anybody has a question about cat behavior in particular, but you're welcome to ask me about dog behavior too. By all means, interrupt me anytime. I'm just happy to uh, have information and to share it with you. But this is an excellent book that I've been reading. Um, it's not really about pets at all. Um, in fact, it's called, I'll show it to you. Let me turn the camera around. There we go. And it's called The Splendid and the Vile by Eric Larson. Um, and if you can see here in front of that full moon, is a whole bunch of Royal Air Force fighters, Spitfire fighters, uh, in, the, in the skies during World War II. And, um, you know, I'm not so much a, a war buff by any means, but r people who have made an enormous difference, like Winston Churchill, now that gets my attention. And in fact, let me just uh, tell you a little bit about this thing. This was, the name of the book is The Splendid and the Vile, a saga of Churchill, 
family and defiance during the Blitz. And I, I want to read you just a little bit about this because it has to do with this cat. Um, and, uh, you know, if you, if you pay much attention to history, you know that he was a real central figure in the Allies prevailing during World War II against the Nazis. And he was a um, pretty tough character. But he had a soft side, and I believe it made a very big difference. So when he was elected prime minister in uh, 1940, uh, so let me just read you a little bit. Now came moving day for the Churchills. On Friday, June 14th, with deposed Prime Minister Chamberlain having left Number 10 Downing Street, of course it's still the, like the White House of Great Britain, the Churchills began transferring their belongings from Admiralty House to their new residential quarters. Clementine, who was Winston Churchill's wife, had spelled like Clementine, like the fruit, but they pronounced it Clemmy, uh, Clementine, and they called her Clemmy for short. Clementine directed the operation. Moving in any area is a stressful affair, but the strain certainly was amplified by the fact that France was about to fall and invasion of Great Britain loomed. Clementine, however, seemed to weather it well, as her friend Violet Bonham Carter found when she stopped at Admiralty House for tea. Now, I spent a summer in, in um, England when I was a college student, when I was finishing my undergraduate work just before starting veterinary school. And they're just really they're wonderful people. Oh, look, McNicholas here. Wonderful. Thank you. That's my, that's my youngest sister. Thank you for showing up, Margaret. Um, so anyway, uh, she stopped at Admiralty House for tea, and we always stopped work mid-afternoon for tea in England. Um, so the house was still fully decorated and furnished. It was looking cool and delicious, full of flowers, and all their lovely pictures lit up. She wrote in her diary on June 11th, 1940. Clemmy was absolutely her normal self, chirpy, very sweet, and always a little more amusing than one expects to find her. The Churchills brought to ten, number 10 Downing a new family member, the Admiralty's black cat Nelson, named after Vice Admiral Horatio Nelson, hero of the British naval victory at Trafalgar. Churchill adored the cat and often carried him about the house. Nelson's arrival caused a certain degree of feline strife, according to Mary, that was uh, Churchill's uh, daughter, one of his daughters, for Nelson harassed the cat that already resided at number 10 Downing Street, whose nickname was the Munich Mouser. And by the way, I talked about this before, our two cats, Gaston here and Tony, who's on the floor again. Tony, you coming back up here? He'll be back up. Um, Tony was like 10 years old when Gaston was a kitten and showed up. And so often when you have an adult resident cat, um, boy, they just don't mix well. Uh, we sort of didn't have a choice because Gaston picked us. And there's Tony. Um, you know, we were going to find him a home when we found him stray as a kitten. And, of course, his home turned out to be ours. Um, so then here's something that happened during the course of the story. Let me just read this little bit to you as well. On the evening of Monday, October 14th, 1940, while Churchill was dining with guests in the newly fortified garden rooms at 10 Downing Street, a bomb fell so close to the building that it blew out windows and destroyed the kitchen and sitting room. I mean, this is like a bomb being dropped in, on the lawn of the White House. I mean, these people endured enormous struggle, and Churchill just really did have that stiff upper lip and stood up against it. Um, he was an inspiration. Uh, soon after the bombing, Clementine, in a letter to Violet Bonham Carter, her friend, wrote, We have no gas or hot water and are cooking on an oil stove. But as a man called to Winston out of the darkness the other night, it's a grand life if we don't weaken. Okay, those are the British. Well, um, the same night 10 Downing was struck, bombs also caused major damage to the nearby Treasury Building and a direct hit destroyed the Carlton Club. Um, Harold Nicholson got a full account uh, from one guest, future Prime Minister Harold Macmillan. They heard the bombs screaming down and ducked instinctively. Nicholson recorded in his diary on October 15th, there was a loud crash, the main lights went out, and the whole place was filled with the smell of cordite and the dust of rubble. The side lights on the tables remained alight, glimmering murkily in the thick fog which settled down on everything, plastering their hair and their eyebrows with thick dust. There were about 120 people at the club when the bomb detonated 
but none was seriously hurt. An astonishing escape, wrote Nicholson. With Britain's seat of government under fire, prudence dictated a fresh retreat to Checkers. That was the weekend estate that Churchill had. He and his family were filthy rich, but running out of money um, all the time. Cars and secretaries were marshaled. The usual convoy set off, moving slowly through rubble-strewn seats. Streets, sorry. A dozen miles or so out, Churchill abruptly asked, Where's Nelson? Meaning, of course, the cat. Nelson was not in the car, nor did he appear to be in any of the other vehicles. Churchill ordered his driver to turn around and go back to number 10 Downing Street. There, a secretary cornered the terrified cat and trapped him under a wastebasket. With Nelson safely aboard, the cars resumed their journey. So, you know, the United States had not entered the war yet. It was going to be, you know, about another year before we did. And Britain was just struggling. And Churchill often was beseeching FDR to try to get us to help them out. Uh, there was a lot of struggle in this country about being isolationist and all that. But um, despite his struggles and the enormous burden on his shoulders and the capital of England getting bombed and, and other major cities as well, um, that cat meant a great deal to him. Do you think that cat brought him some comfort? <laughs> yeah, I guess so. And you know, as I'm reading this book right now, I keep I questioning myself, is this a good thing for me to be reading while, you know, the whole world is under siege with the coronavirus epidemic? I mean, we're not getting bombed, but there are people who aren't going to make it. I mean, and you know, it's sort of giving me some strength. Me, I've got a couple of questions here. Nelson was my cat. Yes, Margaret, I did think about your cat, Nelson. Um, I don't know if you named him after Horatio Nelson, the, the uh, British naval war hero, but I certainly thought of that when I, when I read about uh, Churchill's cat. And see, I did not know that he was a pet person. Alexandra, thank you so much for turning in. Devil in the White City is about Chicago during 1893 Columbia Exposition and a breeding ground uh, for the first serial killer. Oh my goodness. Gee, that's, uh, that's pretty grim. <laughs> Gee. So anyway, just as that as a as a prelude here, I wanted to talk to you folks about, well, anyway, has anybody read this book? And number number two, this author, Eric Larson, he's written Devil in the White City and Dead Wake, which are, according to the description on the back of the book, are uh, somewhat fictionalized historical accounts. He is a, as the British would say, a frightfully good writer. I'm just enjoying this book to no end. I'm a little more than halfway through it. It's about 500 pages. But it is so well written, it doesn't seem like a long book. It seems like a, a really well done book. And there's a great deal of history and humanity in this thing and people hanging together. And it's really inspirational for me with this epidemic. And as much as we're sheltering in place, um, the two Nickel family cats have made a big difference. Um, and so one of the things I wanted to talk about just briefly here was, uh, you know, Nelson, Winston Churchill's cat, when they left number 10 Downing Street to get the heck out of there, uh, because they, you know, the leadership of Great Britain was under siege. And he turned around to get his cat, and, and the secretary found the cat terrified and trapped it under a wastebasket. My guess is that they probably had to corner that cat uh, that was already terrified. Um, cats tend to hide out under den-like structures when they're frightened. And is that the best way to do this? Because people encounter that problem often where they've got a scared to death cat and what are they supposed to do to catch the cat? And should you really catch the cat? I would not argue for a minute that Churchill should not have got that cat and brought it with him. Number one, it was at great risk. Number two, the cat was a great comfort. Um, the cat habitually, you learn from the book, um, would move with the Churchill family from number 10 Downing Street to the weekend retreats so they could get the heck out of there and get a break from the strain, but also so they could move around so the Nazis couldn't find them as easily. Um, and they took that cat with them. So the cat was accustomed to travel, um, and they really needed to catch that cat. And so sometimes you got to do what you got to do. But if you need to catch your cat at home, like they take it to the veterinarian, and people tell me that sometimes they come in with their cat, and they go, oh, boy, did we have trouble. I'm sorry we were late. We had to catch this cat. Well, the truth is that... Cats do get easily scared, and there's something that any species can, uh, well, fall victim to, and that's called one-event learning, where something is associated with such an intense 
emotion, usually fear, that only one exposure will last a lifetime, and cats are the absolute masters of one event learning. And you just want to avoid that. So if a cat gets badly frightened um, by uh, you know, getting chased around and getting cornered, um, it can last forever, and you damage the cat. So that should be reserved for the most extenuating circumstances. And I have another question here. Rita, hey, Rita, Deadwake was really good. He wrote Isaac's Storm about the Galveston hurricane, too. Very good. Uh, Rita, thank you for tuning in. Rita goes way back with me with her and her husband Rob have this really excellent cat named Kitty Girl. And Kitty Girl was a behavior case of mine a long time ago, back when I was also practicing general medicine. Um, and she improved and continues to do well to this day. And Kitty Girl is about 18, I think, right now. Um, he moved, uh, you folks moved to Texas, I think. And um, they, uh, they have been so patient and so kind with that cat, and they have brought out her best. Sort of like when I started this, talking about a teacher or maybe a, an older sibling or, a, or even a parent that was particularly gentle and kind and, and brought out the best. So, cats, you've got a scared cat, how do you bring out the best? You really don't do anything. You don't pursue a scared cat. In fact, what you do is you wait. Um, you can leave out food, but when a cat's really frightened, and it's holed up in some little corner somewhere, you close the door to that room and you turn off the light. <clears throat> you don't play music. You don't put it on the television. You try to keep the house relatively quiet. You put food and water in there and litter. And if that cat takes 48 to 72 hours to finally talk itself off the ledge, that's what you do, and you wait for the cat to come out. When cats release excitatory neurotransmitters, Adrenaline, of course, is the best known, but there are others. The, the biggest one, of course, is something called glutamate. And when the brain is besieged by this just uh, huge release of these excitatory neurotransmitters, the cat's prefrontal cortex, where they do their thinking and can actually calm themselves down, that part of the brain doesn't work. And we humans and our dogs and other species are also prone to that panic where you cannot make a logical decision. It's physiologically not possible in the brain. Well, some cats, it only goes on for a few seconds, but others, it can go on for two or three days, and you do not push them. You give them time, and you put out the food, and you allow them to come to you. Um, you don't pursue them. Um, now, here's something, sort of on a related note. You're stuck at home, and uh, you're not really supposed to be going out, although the trip that we had planned today, and that we will do next Thursday, uh, at the Rio Grande Bosque, uh, there's a lot of space between people, and the only two people getting close enough together to worry about is, well, Miss America will be there with us, and my wife Carolyn will be there, but we spend a lot of time together anyway. Um, but there will be people walking along on, that, uh, on the trail right near the river, and there's a wonderful ditch there, an irrigation ditch called the Clear Ditch. Um, it's just a gorgeous area, and so we'll be there next week. But uh, we won't be getting in close contact with anybody. But let's talk about what we can do at home with our cat. And what I'd like to do is teach you how to teach your cat to come when called. Really? Oh yeah, really. Tony here, um, our two sons taught him to come when called when he was, I don't know, about five years old and they were just like, I don't know, eight or 10. And at the either end of our hallway in our house, I set each boy up with a little treat bag and tasty cat treats. And so with one boy holding the cat, our other son was at the end of the hallway and tossed a little treat in front of our cat, Tony, and called his name. And you don't have to use the command. And using that you know, commanding tone that we sometimes will use with a dog doesn't work with this species. So he just said, Tony, as he tossed the treat out. And when Tony came for the treat, he would capture the behavior and say the cat's name again, and the cat got, us, got accustomed to saying, well, gee, when I hear my name and I come towards this person, I get food. Well, it wasn't very many repetitions, like three or four. The, the boys were at the opposite ends of the, of the hallway, and one boy would say, Tony, and Tony would run for that boy and get a treat and eat the treat, and then the other boy at the other end would go, Tony, and he would turn on his little heels and take off in the other direction and run to him and get a treat. And these boys have, you know, a wonderful time because kids enjoy that kind of stuff. 
And you know, they played this game for about 10 minutes. And ever since then, I mean, that was probably 10 years ago. And ever since then, you say this cat's name anywhere, and he turns and looks at you, and he actually might come. Now, of course, you can use other, uh, other ways of, of luring a cat. Well, no, it's up on the shelf. But we've got this Tupperware plastic thing that has this dry food that these cats think is wonderful. And you shake this thing, and the cats come when they hear that. But teaching a cat to come when cold is a pretty darn good thing. And so if a cat is only moderately frightened, you can shake the dry food or some other treat that the cat understands. But use the cat's name when you do it so that if you don't have food, the cat knows to come when it's called. Well, you know, it's pretty useful to have your cat come to you when you want your cat, especially if the cat might be scared. But there's other value in doing this in that cats like structure too. They're not dogs with short ears. Um, they're a different species altogether. Um, here's a wonderful book. Thank you, Carolyn. Um, this is a book called Training Your Cat. Let me turn this around. This book might be out of print, but I think you can still get it. And this is by, oh, wait a minute. Oh, I didn't really turn the camera around. I just thought I did. There you go. It's called Training Your Cat. And it's by Dr. Kurtzy Sexel, S-E-K-S-E-L. Dr. Kurtzy Sexel, I know this lady. She is a, a member of the American College of Veterinary Behaviors, where I got my, um, can I hand that back to you, Carolyn? Um, where I did my training for my behavior residency. And Dr. Sexel, this is not a book that was written, oh, I've turned off the extra light, there we go. This book was not written um, for veterinarians or veterinary behaviorists, it was written for cat parents. And it's got a whole lot of different ways in there of teaching your cat different commands. It's terribly well done. Um, she even goes in there a little bit into something that she calls kitten kindy, which is kitten socialization classes, which are really valuable because they can learn that other cats are actually fine. Um, if you've ever had struggles with cat fights at your house, oh brother. I mean, I, I treat that problem often. And uh, yes, Charlotte is, um, oh, Charlotte comes when called. Charlotte is uh, my sister-in-law Anne's cat. And uh, so, you know, they come when they're called, and if they're nervous or frightened, you can derail them. And in fact, we talked about that a little bit last week when we went to the Bekeke open space with Miss America here, that when you've got a dog who's nervous and you can give that dog, or in this case, a cat, a command, response, reward sequence, very simple, tell the cat or dog what you want, they perform because you've trained them in a very much zero stress situation. And then the cat or dog is nervous about something and they know that there is a reliable result when they hear their name. And they come and they're called and they get that interaction and they get the food reward and they get some gentle petting. And remember with cats, and both of my cats are on the floor now, um, I'll pretend that Miss America here is a, is a cat. <laughs> a 37 pound cat with fuzzy ears. Um, um, cats like rubbing and petting on their head and their ears and their neck. That's kind of it with cats. But they earn that gentle feline specific grooming structure reliably and they know that if they're nervous, if there's something stressful going on and then they come when they're called, they, uh, they can earn that touch um, and you repeat that often in a zero stress situation so that when you need it to um, redirect the cat away from its fear, away from its anxiety, you got something to make that cat feel better and you too will feel better. And when we've got these stressful problems right now, like this epidemic, we are uh, needing all the help we can all get. And so you're putting yourself in a leadership position. Think of yourself as Winston Churchill. Um, and I'll bet that... Uh, Cat Nelson of his was really uh, pretty darn uh, happy to go with him and get the heck out of 10 Downing Street. Well, if anybody's ever got any other questions, you're certainly welcome to uh, run them past me here. Um, I know some of these cats who are showing up on my I iPhone screen here. And any other questions, be sure to send them to me on my Facebook page. And by the way, this Facebook Live and every week's Facebook Live and more often there are dogs. Um, I try to mix cats in there every chance I can. Um, 
but those are always available to subscribers of my website, which is drjeffnickel.com, D-R-J-E-F-F-N-I-C-H-O-L.com. And uh, if you subscribe, which is, of course, no charge, thank you very much for some hearts and wows there. Um, you can subscribe at no charge at all, and every week you will get the previous, usually Thursday, sometimes Wednesday, Facebook Live, and my weekly blog, my media blog, which is my column in the Albuquerque Journal. Um, and when you do subscribe at no charge, you will also get my free at-home pet first aid and CPR guide. And those are worth printing out and sticking to the fridge just in case. Um, and you're welcome to share this video with any of your kitty-loving friends. Um, and uh, thank you for sharing this with me. Thank you for being here with me. Um, this sheltering in place thing isn't very much fun for me. My behavior consultations right now, instead of going into the uh, veterinary specialty hospital, where I typically see them in person, we're doing these things by phone right now, and people are sending me videos. In fact, if you call my office and you need a behavior consultation, uh, we will give you a Dropbox link by email, and um, then you can upload videos of the cat or dog's behavior and then we can do a consultation and uh, just about as good as being in person and a whole lot better than not doing it at all. People think sometimes, oh, there's no behavioral emergencies. Well, there certainly are. If you have a pet who is really freaked out, aggressive, uh, compulsive, involved in spinning or other repetitive, destructive behaviors, uh, damage to the house, self-mutilation, uh, fighting with other pets, biting people, um, and you're getting to be at wit's end, and, and unfortunately, that's when a lot of people contact me. Um, last resort, when in fact, I wish they'd come early in the game. Um, and they may be ready to say, gosh, I've tried everything, and I'm ready to give up. For goodness sake, don't do that. We cannot save them all, but we absolutely make a significant difference in almost every case we see, because behavior medicine is research-based, it's an exploding area of active research. Uh, sometimes I share these research papers during these Facebook Lives, and there's a great deal that we can do for so many of these pets. So if you or someone you know has a pet that's really causing a problem and says, gee, I'm gonna have to wait until we're given the all clear in this epidemic to get anything done, I don't know if we can hold out that long, you absolutely can contact me. You can contact me through Facebook. Uh, you can contact me through the website or you can call our phone number, which is on our Facebook page, and we can get started and give you a hand with this thing. So thank you again for sharing this with me. And uh, what about clicker training cats? I found that it works very well, Margaret. You are absolutely correct. Clicker training is something that works. They've, been, they've done it with chickens. They've done it with angelfish. Some of my colleagues, uh, veterinary behaviorists, uh, PhD behaviorists, uh, trainers who become educated in behavior disorders of pets, um, they use clickers for every species. And those who have gotten, well, they become clicker enthusiasts. Um, you can actually go to chicken camp each summer, yeah, believe it or not, where there are chickens that people clicker train. And you think, what is the point in that? Well, I'll tell you the point in that is. I've raised chickens. Um, and actually, a couple of them became pretty good pets of mine. Most of them, though, aren't very bright. I mean, they've got a couple of neurons to rub together, but that's kind of the extent of it. And they will respond, and you can teach them a lot of stuff with clickers. And the reason that the clicker, by the way, works as well as it does, um, and we, we've understood clickers since, I think, the late 60s they were developed uh, to teach tricks to dolphins at SeaWorld. Well, it turns out that having your thumb on the clicker button is something that you can respond to with the behavior that you want in about a half a second. That's the typical reaction time of most people. You see the dog's rear end hit the floor when you say sit, or the cat comes to you when you call, and boom, you hit that clicker. Well, that marks the behavior. Well, we, it's been used on so many other species. Well, with modern brain imaging, we now know, like PET scans and MRIs, we know now that we can measure the transit time between different neural centers in the brain, and there are many more different neural inputs to every behavior. 
Well, that transit time between these areas of the brain is, turns out, about a half a second, which is the reaction time that we have. So when you mark a behavior, you actually teach the creature, whoever it is, that they're going to actually start working for the click. It's physiologic. And then the treat follows. And you, you can teach clicker training. Click, treat, click, treat when the pet does something that you like. Yeah, you can do it by operant conditioning where the, the pet learns to figure out something you like and then get immediately reinforced with the click and the food. So where food is a primary reinforcer for any of us because we all work for it, um, the dog or the cat can learn to work for the clicker. And, um, and then the food comes later. And the beauty of the clicker is that they learn four times as fast and they retain the memory uh, four times as long than getting, say, a food reward into their mouth two seconds after they've completed the behavior. Um, and so we'll do a, a Facebook Live on Clicker training. Um, it's actually a great deal of fun, and you can combine it with other things like teaching a dog to target, a cat can learn to target, and again, you derail them, you redirect them from something that is a problem for them, and they get to do something that's reliable and that they understand. Um, so, Margaret, thank you for bringing that up. I think that's a uh, Clicker training is wonderful. And, uh, you know, there's no reason that teaching our pets things shouldn't be anything but the same kind of joy that that adult you knew as a child, uh, whoever that was, brought out your best. In my case, I had a chemistry teacher in high school named Mr. Moreland. And I'll always remember that man with such fondness. He was patient. He went over things until you got it. He explained it in ways that you knew he was enjoying doing it because... He knew you were enjoy learning it. And I did very well in my class because I enjoyed it. Um, and we can do that with other people and we can start it at home with our pets. Um, I tell clients that clickers bridge what you're saying and what the animal is doing in order to teach them English. It also shapes the behavior. Explain that if you can. Well, it absolutely does. Um, again, because they work for the clicker. Um, and they're paying attention because you're, you are sharpening their mind. They're working fast. And in behavior modification or in training, this is called density, where you speed up the commands and the responses. Not super fast, but you accelerate it. And the clicker is a very good tool for doing that. And that sharpens their focus. And they not only learn more reliably, but when you need it, because that pet is freaked out by something uh, and you've got that clicker handy, it works great. There's a wonderful book, by the way, called Click to Calm. Um, it's a short book. It does a great job. And you can look that up on Amazon and get Click to Calm. So thank you again, everybody. I appreciate everybody's participation. And um, I hope you all have a great week. And please take this epidemic seriously. Uh, we veterinarians are taught a great deal about managing runaway diseases because they're seen not just in dogs and cats, Things like parvo, most dog parents are aware of that, um, but in livestock. And uh, epidemiology is a significant part of my training. And so when we hear about the controls that are put on us by our various state governors, that nobody likes, no groups bigger than five people, at least six feet apart, shutting down businesses, uh, it's a real drag and people are going to die of this thing but a lot fewer of us are going to be affected and we'll get through this much faster uh, if we do exactly as we're told. And so I encourage everybody to take this seriously and enjoy your pets. <laughs> so thank you and be safe and I'll see you next week.